Hello and welcome to the first of our discussions here on LOCAD TV. Today we're going to be talking about a subject that's divided a lot of opinion in the supply chain industry, forecasting accuracy. I'm delighted to say that today I'm joined by the CEO and founder of LOCAD, Johannes Vermeerel, who's going to give me a bit of help with today's discussion. So Johannes, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Kieran. Yeah. Um, so, Johannes, if you look at the supply chain industry as a whole, you often see practitioners complaining a lot about the accuracy of their forecasts. However, if you look at the software vendors, they often claim to have very high accuracies. They both can't be right, so what's your take on the situation? Yes, the, the situation is, is puzzling, certainly. Um, over the last probably two decades, uh, maybe longer, uh, on every single large supply chain trade show, it appears that there is at least one um, enterprise software vendor who claims to have reduced uh, um, the forecasting error by 50% or something. So obviously, if you compound 50% per year of, of reduction of error over 20 years, what you should logically end up with is no forecasting error at all which is obviously not the present state of the supply chain industry. So, um, so, so clearly, clearly uh, the reality is that forecasting errors are still pretty much present. And, um, but also another way to look at it is that um, percentages, so to, to think that you can reduce the forecasting error of X percent is also the, the wrong way to even look at the question. Um, uh, forecasting errors n cost money to company expressed in dollars, not in percent. So what we should truly be looking at are the dollars of error for, uh, for, for, for companies running supply chain in the real world. Okay, so I suppose that makes kind of a lot of sense because fundamentally businesses are there to make money. And that's kind of basic economics, isn't it? That yeah. uh, companies can kind of want to maximize their profits and businesses as a whole kind of profit from that. And um, us as society, we can also profit because we're getting a, a better range of products for lower prices. However, that's not what we're really seeing in the industry. The industry is still very hung up on using percentages. So why are they so hung up on that? What's the reason for that? Yes, um, I guess the, the core of the maybe addiction, you know, the mean absolute percentage error addiction uh, is rooted in the fact that uh, percentages are easy. You know, it's a, it's a very easy thing to come up with a, person, uh, with a percentage. Uh, nobody gets really committed to anything uh, in, with, a, with a percentage. You don't, uh, are, you're not going to often um, the budget of anyone with a percentage. So dollars of error are actually uh, makes more sense, but suddenly it, uh, it clarifies also the stakes and who should be accountable for the error. And again, the companies who operate large supply chains are made of a lot of people. And, it's, uh, and those people, by the very fact that they are part of a large organization in the first place, tend to be kind of risk adverse. They, they don't really want to, 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 to put forward something that would antagonize the rest of their organization. And if you start to express the forecasting error in dollars, that's exactly what you're going to do in practice, just because you're going to pinpoint uh, the areas that are truly responsible for the dollars of error. So that's, so, so yes, percentages are, are easy, dollars are just the right thing. But that's, so that's, that's probably why we're, we're still stuck with this situation. It's, uh, okay. uh, the easy thing is just easier to do. Yeah, okay. So if we put aside for now the, the dollars of error and just take the percentages of error yes. for an example, I mean, is there any technological process that can be followed in order to improve the percentage of error? I mean, what can software companies do in that regard? Yeah, I mean, obviously, despite the fact that errors have, forecasting errors have not improved by 50% a year over the last uh, 20 years or so, the forecasting accuracy did improve. And actually, um, the bulk of the improvement was driven not by um, uh, progress that came from within the supply chain world at all. It came from, um, I would say, a very broad technological progress from a, a domain known as um, statistical learning, uh, more commonly known as machine learning, and probably where the, the latest flavor of that is actually 
deep learning. But so there, there has been a real uh, technological progress that, that had happened um, during the last 20 years. It goes by different names, but if you apply those, um, those techniques to um, demand planning and, and, and demand forecasting in supply chain, you get a very significant measurable uh, improvement in forecasts and basically no matter which metric is actually used to measure the progress so you get a progress in percents but you also get a progress in dollars so the progress is very real in this direction not just the magnitude of what most uh, enterprise software vendors would claim in general okay but there must be kind of another way that we can improve the accuracy of these forecasts, for example. I mean, could the businesses and the software vendors, could they change the, the accuracy of their processes? Could they, for example, better train their teams? Like, what can they do? So, I mean, there, there are two things that they can, they can do. First, they can redefine the very scope of the forecasts themselves. So what do I mean? Um, I mean uh, basically to transition toward probabilistic forecasts. So the, 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 the traditional flavor of forecast is just telling you about something. It's making a statement about a single future. You're saying my future demand is going to be exactly this number, one statement. Now probabilistic forecasts are taking a much more holistic view. Say, Many things can happen. There is an irreducible uncertainty about the future, and so I'm going to assign probabilities to all those futures. So that's one way for companies to improve, is to adopt forecast that tells more about the future. It's a tricky idea. The forecast doesn't have to be more accurate. It just has to tell you more about the future. So that's the essence of probabilistic forecast. That would be one side. And then the other side about the, the people is, um, is, is indeed is to think of what can you do to have people who actually leverage of those forecasts to design, actually to craft better decisions. So that's, that's another angle, which is, okay, you have better forecasts, but can you really turn them into uh, actually better supply chain decisions? Because in the end, better supply chain decisions that have like a, a physical measurable impact is all that matters. So that's the, uh, that's the two angles that we have on the, on the table, I guess. Okay. And in order to sort of drive these probabilistic forecasts, they're sort of driven by data, if that's yes. correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the data sort of side of things, I mean, where do you draw the line? Because for instance, things like the weather are quite interesting. Like in the summer, I'm more likely to buy an ice cream, whereas in the winter, I'm probably more likely to buy things like hot chocolates and scarves and gloves and things like that. Um, so these things are interesting. So could we use things like weather forecasts in the probabilistic forecast? So yes, that, that's, that's a very broad question of where does the forecasting accuracy comes from. You know, it, it, there is information that needs to make its way into the forecast. So the, the, the information has to come from somewhere. So obviously, uh, the first place where you can look for this information is the historical data of the company itself. Uh, my own pers personal opinion on that is that considering the present state of, I would say, 99% of the supply chains in the world, um, uh, those companies are not even uh, exploiting, I would say, to their fullest extent the data they already have, which is of very high quality because it's transactional data. And, and, and there is really a lot of it. So that probably the first thing is to exploit what you have and what is readily available, that your, that your transactional historical data. Then the second idea is what about those external sources of data? Weather forecast would be you know, one, one source of data. Um, so that, that brings, I would say, two, at least two different concerns. First, weather forecasts are imperfect. So you want to build forecast on top of other forecasts. So basically, you, you have kind of a problem of compounding forecasting inaccuracies. That's a, that's a very, very difficult problem to solve in practice. And, um, and, and basically, whenever you, you f you're thinking of a supply chain problems, usually you need, to think, you need to think more than seven days ahead. And if you have to think more than seven days ahead, the accuracy of the weather forecast become dismal in practice. So, so, um, so that, that's a very, very, I would say, 
um, problematic angle to, to leverage the weather forecast. Then you have another problem, which is um, for anybody who have actually tried, we did, <laughs> uh, try to leverage for um, weather forecasts for uh, statistical forecasting purposes. Uh, this is real big data we are talking about. Um, uh, weather forecast is not one data point. It's like one data point per hour per square kilometer uh, per every 20 minutes looking ahead. And it's not just, you know, there is not such thing as the weather. I mean, it's, it's temperature, humidity, wind, wind direction, uh, light. Uh, so, so actually, the amount of data that you want to bring into your uh, supply chain to refine your supply chain forecast is like completely gigantic. We're talking literally of bringing terabytes of data in. Um, the practicalities involved of doing that are just actually staggering. It's very difficult. So, so there, are, there are things that are much easier to do than actually uh, trying to leverage, um, I would say, a global weather system into your supply chain. Mm -hmm. like much easier to do. In okay. So in practice, <laughs> weather is probably not the best example to use. But what about something like the, the human brain? Yeah. Like it's an incredibly powerful tool. Yeah. Is there any way that we could <laughs> harness that in order to improve our forecasts? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, you know, the, the machines, the, the algorithms that we have right now, they are not fundamentally doing something that is completely superhuman. I mean, um, you can have superhuman capabilities for very specific problems like playing Go or chess. But um, supply chains at large is a very, very open problem. Uh, and so that requires the full extent of the human intelligence. So it's, it's really not something where just um, a dumb computer can actually beat uh, a, a supply chain specialist because it takes, it takes a lot more. Um, but also, uh, the, the one problem with human intelligence is not that it isn't good. Uh, it's, so, it's so incredibly expensive. And um, so you see, you have thousands, if not millions, of supply chains to take every day for any large supply chain company. So the question is, how many people, smart people, can you afford to take those decisions that need to be made every single day? And the answer, I mean, we have quite a few clients at Locad. The, the, the typical answer of all our clients is how many p smart people can we afford? The answer is way too few. Way too few. So, um, so yes, yes, people can, the inputs of people can be extremely valuable to, to reduce uh, the forecasting error, but it doesn't scale. And that's a very, very, uh, I would say, practical problem. And that's, by the way, the reason why this whole industry is relying on software companies to do that. It's precisely because those people are just too expensive. Okay, so we touched on quite an important <laughs> point there, is there are these smart people out there. I mean, how are we making best use of those smart people within these companies? I mean, where should they focus their abilities? Should they be using their intuition and their knowledge to somehow be incorporated in the systems? Or how would you work with that? Yeah, so, so the, the question is, is really, I believe, the, 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 the question that deserves to be answered is how do we make a capitalistic use of those people in order to reduce the forecasting error? So, so you don't want to have people where that you just consume and where you, you kind of consume and discard the insights because that's, that's treating the insights that those people produce as consumable. Uh, no, that, that's just the wrong way to, to look at the problem. You need to treat those people as uh, in a capitalistic manner, in a manner that capitalizes over time so that when they do something, your supply chain is better. If they, if they do something else, it's better again. And if they repeat this process, it's continuous improvement. So now, what can they actually be doing to actually refine the forecasting accuracy? Uh, well, one of, the, one of the things they can do is to qualify the data better and to ensure uh, continuous improvement in the stream of data that is fed into the forecasting system. Well, because, um, you know, data quality doesn't fall from the sky, it's, it's not a given. It's something that requires, I would say, very uh, pretty much ongoing efforts to be maintained and to be improved. And again, um, there, when I was saying that transactional data uh, is the way forward to actually produce forecasts, 
um, transaction data can be improved themselves. For example, there is very few companies that accurately track the history of stockouts. But if you want to forecast you know, future demand, you need to be able to differentiate whether you didn't have any sales over a given period because there was no demand or because you were having a stock out and I guess that uh, you didn't have anything to serve. So that's, uh, and uh, the question is, are you properly recording all this data? And there are tons of things, stock outs, but also promotions, uh, your own price, the price of your competitors. I mean, there is no, there, there is a lot of things that you can include in your data set that are very actionable and that can make your forecast uh, more accurate, ultimately. Okay. Yes. And talking about forecasting accuracy, what about for a product that is never been launched yet? So for industries such as technology and fashion, you've got no historical data um, and they're very wildly erratic, aren't they, these industries? Yeah. So do you have any hope whatsoever of getting accurate forecasts in these industries or not at all? Okay, um, so that's a, that's a very, very tricky question. Um, because the question is not first, first, I believe the question is not about do you, can you get an accurate forecast in an absolute sense? I mean, because if, if the question is really can I have an accurate forecast at predicting what is going to be um, uh, the product that is going to be trendy next year uh, on, within the fashion marketplace, I would probably not even be doing uh, statistical forecast for LOCAD, I would actually play you know, um, uh, the stock market and, and just make a living out of it. So the, the question is, how can you make a forecast that is not accurate in an absolute sense, that is just more accurate than uh, the forecast that your human teams can produce just because they are very short on time. So that the true metric is not an absolute accuracy, but more a relative accuracy to what people can do given the time that they have to actually come up with an answer. So that, that first step. So, so uh, accurate forecast, I would say, yeah, no, sorry. It, it's, I mean, fashion is so erratic. There is no hope that can, you can have something that could be super accurate in an absolute sense, but you can have something that is comparably more accurate. Now, the question is, can you have a statistical forecast that works at all? Uh, in, in, in fashion, let's say. Because indeed, the products that you want to forecast has no historical data whatsoever. So it's puzzling because statistical forecast relies data. But, but here, you have, a, you have an angle. You have an angle is that if you're a fashion company, you are pushing thousands of products to the market every year. So what appears to be kind of a completely new product, it's not that completely new. I mean, let's say it's a, it's a new shirt. Uh, I mean, it turns out that you're actually launching hundreds of shirts every year. So, so this product doesn't come uh, from a vacuum. Uh, it comes from, uh, uh, it, it emerged within uh, a market that you can observe for your own sales. So if you want to have, um, to build a, uh, a statistical forecast, this forecast is going to leverage all your past historical launches and the attributes that you have of the product so that you can correlate this new shirt that you're launching right now with uh, shirts that you've launched in the past and, um, and um, what remains that is the complete erraticity of the, the, the fashion uh, industry is going to be the, 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 the forecasting inaccuracy that you're going to produce. But, but you see the point is that um, yes, you can tackle and you can produce that are, I would say, accurate enough to be profitable forecast even for product launches. Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, shameless plug, that's exactly what, what we are doing <laughs> at Lookout, but I guess you know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today, but uh, thank you for your time and taking the time out to talk to us today. Um, we hope that you at home have really enjoyed our discussion, and if you've got any questions or anything you'd like to ask us, feel free to get in touch, either drop us an email or even leave a comment below. Uh, who knows, maybe over the next coming weeks, we might be able to discuss some of the more interesting questions. So until that time, thanks very much for joining us today, and we'll see you again very soon.